We're in a new series, a new study that we started a couple weeks ago. It's called Onward, Outward, and Upward, or Onward, Upward, Outward, whatever arrangement of those three, um, three, whatever. Man, I want to do this for myself. Not antonyms, they're synonyms. Synonyms, is that the right? Oh, I know English, come on. Lindsay's homeschooling right now, and there's like things that are coming up as refreshers. And, um, and I feel really good when I learn things again for like, you know, the fifth time. So um, onward, <laughs> outward, and upward. And, um, and you get the point. Uh, this is the point of the, the mission of God and the Great Commission. And it's what we're studying together, talking about through this series. And, um, and I'll say this up front. If you guys ever get bored of, um, of the mission of God, if you get tired of hearing about it, um, you got to find yourself, not a new church, but a new religion okay it just won't work for you like this this is what it all is about is the the mission of God and the the great commission that uh, we've been preaching through this that the before God even had a creation he had a mission it, it's what's on his heart it's what um, he beats it's what he communicates and it's it's what you and I have been invited into as disciples and followers of Jesus into the work of the great commission and so um, I, I want to start with this verse and you guys uh, probably will hear this on repeat. I, I come back to it all the time. It's one of my favorite verses. Um, Romans chapter 10, 13 through 15, it says this, for everyone, someone say everyone, everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. Now, um, it, we, we were talking about this, and um, some of you guys have heard this story on repeat. Um, it's one of them I can't give up. Um, it's just such an amazing story, but um, yeah, I'm going to give you the brief, brief synopsis of it. Lindsay has this friend, uh, my wife Lindsay, uh, her name's Erin, and Erin about um, four years ago, five years ago, um, was um, led to the Lord just through friendship and communication and this ongoing dialogue that the couple of them had had over the course of about a year. And, um, and Aaron grew up like generations of, of atheism, total rejection of God, disbelief in God. Um, and, and to fast forward it, anyways, came to a place where um, she came to just this confessing, saving faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And, um, and they have this, this amazing friendship today. This is someone that, that didn't know anything, had never read a verse of the Bible, um, didn't know the books that were in the Bible, didn't know who authored the Bible, had never been to church, never heard John 3.16, all these little things that we take for granted because you, you learned them in Sunday school. She had no knowledge of, of the Christian faith whatsoever. And, um, and so, it, which is my favorite thing ever, if you've ever had the joy and the pleasure of leading someone to the Lord who just knows absolutely nothing, it is the greatest um, journey and experience to be a part of because you get to watch the light bulbs just go off continually and the questions that they ask and, and the things that they learn that, that doesn't come with the clutter of some of the things that we've learned wrong. And, um, and it's so just amazing. And, and they, um, to this day, still have these, these conversations. And um, there's this app. Uh, most of you probably don't have this app, but it's called Marco Polo. It's like this video chat app, and you can leave video messages and, and go back and forth. And, and so Aaron and uh, Lindsay, my wife, they will um, Marco Polo back and forth. And so sometimes Lindsay's sitting there listening to him, and I just enjoy listening to the conversation, the dialogue. And, uh, and it came up in one of their messages just like two weeks ago. Um, this verse, this verse, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. And, um, and Aaron said to Lindsay, she goes, Lindsay, you have beautiful feet. You have beautiful feet. And Lindsay said, Aaron tells me that all the time. Your feet are beautiful. Um, and, and I thought, man, that's so, like, just amazing, like, the, the relationship of it. But really should be the goal for all of us um, that you could turn to the person next to you this morning and say, you have some beautiful feet. You have beautiful feet, the messengers who bring the good news. Um, 
Sam, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you out real quick just so uh, you and I, I'll forget later, so I have to do it from the microphone. Um, Sam is full of Bible trivia, and he, he always stumps me with these Bible questions. He's like, all right, what about this one? And um, so we had a conversation the other day um, about who was the, the first, um, like, um, gospel presenter uh, in, in the Bible. Um, and I think we said John the Baptist, right? No? See, I got it wrong already. Anyways. I think what I'm about to give you is a different answer that, that I want to I wanna see if we can go here. Um, I was thinking about it, the, the Gospel of Luke and the shepherds. The shepherds, from what I understand, are, are the very, oh, yeah, we got a light, okay, yeah, all right. So the shepherds, immediately at the proclamation from the angels, a Savior has been born this day in Bethlehem. They go and they see the baby, and they immediately do what? They disperse. They run into all the towns nearby. They don't return to the field. They, they go out and they begin to proclaim this message that a Savior and a Messiah has been born. Everything about the mission of God, about the gospel message, is one of going, is one of, of sending. And, um, and it's why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. And as I was putting this together and I was thinking, um, English is a, a complicated language. Um, it, it, you, we have all these words that can be said the same way. That's right, yeah. English, we have all these words that can be said the same way. Um, but have a completely different meaning. So I want to do a spin on words this morning, um, and I, I want to spell feet, not F-E-E-T, but F-E-A-T, F-E-A-T, feet. And um, if you look up the word feet in um, the, the dictionary, it says this, it's a, a noteworthy or extraordinary act or achievement, usually displaying boldness. And I thought about... The, the connection to this, not that we're not going to rewrite scripture this morning, but if we could dual purpose, dual meaning, beautiful feet or beautiful feet, a, a noteworthy or extraordinary act or achievement usually displaying boldness. Now this week, um, we're in a, a progression through this series, so we'll get to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the empowerment of witness in a, in a few weeks here, but but. I just, I read that definition and I go, man, that's the Holy Spirit, isn't it? The, the empowerment of the boldness to proclaim this message and to proclaim with, with power and with certainty the witness of Jesus Christ. And um, uh, I wanted to come back to a story. You guys have, have heard me reference this book a couple times, um, Until All Know by Heath Adamson. It's uh, talking about planting the seed of the mission, the gospel, and the spirit in the next generation. And the book's full of, of all these incredible stories. And uh, I, I wanted to um, just read you guys this. Uh, it was too long for me to type this morning, so if you really like it, you'll have to get your own copy of the book. But um, if you could just bear with me and, uh, and let me share this to you this morning. He shares this story of a, an Indian evangelist named Sadahu Shalapala uh, who was sleeping in a small village in the north of Madras when he suddenly was wide awake. Immediately upon waking, his heart began to pound, and he sensed an overwhelming burden to leave his house where he was staying and to run away quickly. So he started running. If someone had passed him on the street at such a late hour, they might have asked, why are you running? Chelapala would have responded, I have no idea. Oh, okay, well, where are you going? Do you need a ride? The innocent bystander might have asked. I have no idea where I am going. I only know that God woke me up and told me to run. I'm sure that would have been the conversation to an abrupt end. God woke you up. God told you to run. Kids, stay away from that man. He's creepy. There was nothing convenient about it, and I'm sure Chapala would have been exhausted from his missions trip. But later, as he recounted, he said he was used to receiving unique and inconvenient directions from the Lord. So that night, he was running into the darkness into remote India to a place that he did not know. In the open country, away from the dim lights in the villages and fires as they passed, he passed a large tree. In that moment, he sensed that God wanted him to stop and to begin preaching the gospel. Chalapala did just that. With nobody in sight and nothing but an open field for a congregation, he proclaimed the grace of Jesus Christ. At the end of his message, he gave an opportunity for anyone who could potentially hear him nearby to open their hearts to Christ's forgiveness. 
In the darkness, sobbing echoed throughout the open field as the tree branches parted from above Chapala's head. Without hesitation, a man who was at the top of the tree quickly climbed down and with tear-stained cheeks gave his life to Christ. When Shelapala asked what in the world the man was doing at the top of the tree in the middle of nowhere, the man confessed, I came here to hang myself. What an amazing story of immediate obedience and how remarkable that God loved that man so much that he woke a perfect stranger in the middle of the night to run to a tree and share a message of hope with him. I'm not sure what happened to the man, but I do know that neither he nor Chapala will ever forget that moment. I picture heaven standing at attention while a man climbs the tree with a rope in his hand, and the angels are wondering who will be faith-filled enough and willing to say yes to a summons from God that does not make a lot of sense. What would our response be to such a summons today? Today, God is calling us to serve humanity. Heaven could trust Shapala with such an assignment, and heaven trusts you and me with the same. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice that Jesus does not call us to make converts. After all, he did not come to earth to create Christianity. He came because there is no other name given to mankind by which we must be saved. So he calls on us to go and make disciples. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to wonder what would have happened to the man in the tree if no one had been willing to say yes to what God had asked. There are many others like the man in the tree who have no one to come to in the darkness, but with the gospel and the power of the Spirit, they perish without knowing Jesus. The greatest injustice in all the earth is for someone to live and to die without knowing Christ. This is the most basic human right. And there's millions of stories, and you might even have a personal story that you could share or recount. But I, I loved, as it relates to our message this morning, uh, this, this, this statement that he was used to receiving unique and inconvenient directions from the Lord. And I wonder if, if you and I could get to such a place in our faith, such a, a feat that, that we would say we are used to, we are comfortable These aren't abnormal or awkward occurrences, but they are a regular practice of obedience because the Lord is in regular practice of giving us unique and inconvenient directions. In uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 1 through 3, um, it says this, it says that the Lord chose 72 other disciples and he sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places that he planned to visit. These were the instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send. Someone say send. Send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Now, I'm going to take a a twist and a turn here. Um, A lot of people like to focus on the first part of that verse, uh, to pray to the workers that that they would be sent, and and that the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Um, There's not a lot of preaching, and there's kind of a lot of like, let's just quickly read over this last part that says, now go, someone say go, and remember, I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. (laughs) E. <laughs> right? I, I don't know. Um, I would say like the, the problem today, it, it's amazing when you go back, it, it really hasn't changed. Um, it, it's not a modern predicament that we have few people that are willing to participate in the work of the Great Commission. Jesus, he says it here in Luke 10, that the, the harvest is great. There are people ready to receive the seed and the good news of the gospel but few are, are willing. So pray to the Lord of the harvest. Um, and maybe why we have so few people going out into the harvest fields is this statement that Jesus makes. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Mm. 
I find there's, there's three things that, that hinder the work today of the Great Commission, and the list could probably be longer, but three enough is uh, sufficient for today. Um, and again, I'm not great with the English language, so if I'm using this really big word improperly, let me know and correct me later. Um, but I'm going to call them apprehensions. That word seemed to fit, and I seem to like it. So um, these are what I, I would consider three apprehensions of the Great Commission. Um, the first one is this, is apathy. Someone say apathy. Apathy is a, is a lack of interest or concern for the things that other people find moving or exciting. You ever meet a missionary or someone just compelled by this mission, um, there's no boredom in their spirit. There's no, um, no wonder of, of what they wish they were doing otherwise. I mean, for them, their sole focus is the joy and the commitment to completing the work and the mission of Christ. But there, there's many of us, um, from a place of apathy, we are just not interested. We're not concerned about the things of God or that other people have found moving or exciting. And if you remember back to like the first week we preached this, every single one of us in this room today, if you would claim to be a follower of Jesus, if you would confess faith in Jesus Christ, then the reason you are here at such a point of privilege today is because someone else took seriously the work and the command of the Great Commission. If it hadn't been for them, you and I would not be professing this message today. And so the question is, will we continue to be workers in the fields? And will we continue, this is a big ask, to be lambs among wolves? Um, second apprehension of the gospel, I think, is this, is, is comfort. Comfort, you've probably heard that, that comfort kills. Um, we, we know the analogy of the, the frog and the kettle. Um, I've never done it, um, but I'd love to try it. Uh, you put, supposedly, I mean, I just am taking this for granted because people have told me this, so maybe we could find a frog and, and try it out. Uh, you put a frog in, in water and, and you slowly boil it. The frog will not jump out of the water. That It will acclimate and it will stay in until it's fully cooked and ready to eat. Um, and... Um, the, the other, um, the other like, image that comes to my mind, again, this might be a more modern reference, but if you guys remember the movie WALL-E, it's this kind of climate change political agenda animated movie. Um, you know what I'm talking about if you've seen it. Um, the world has like, completely ceased to like, provide life. You can't have vegetation or plants anymore. So they, they make this space colony, and they're all living in this, this spaceship. And um, my fear in speaking about this is like technology is catching up to the movie and now it's like becoming more and more like a possibility that freaks me out a little bit. But um, they're living in space and robots do everything. Um, I mean, you guys think about laying on the couch and you're like, ask your friend or your, your spouse for the TV remote because you don't want to get up. Um, it's like that, but you don't have to ask another human. Robots do your hair and they wash your body and they brush your teeth and then they bring you food and, and they, they do it all. And, and what you have is these these massive, massively obese humans in these lounge chairs up in space. Um, and uh, at the end of the movie, they all like fall out of their chairs because there's this like gravity malfunction. None of them can stand to their feet because their, their muscles and bones have all atrophied. You guys remember the scene, what I'm talking about? Uh, comfort leads us to a place uh, of this, this, what I imagine. That's the, the word picture in my head when I see it. Three apprehensions of the gospel. One, uh, I'd say apathy. Two, uh, I say that comfort, comfort kills the work of the mission of Christ. Um, and three is, is fear. Someone say fear. Um, and I'm going to say this because this is kind of a big focus of, of the message this morning. Um, misappropriated fear. Because I think fear is actually the ticket to this, and you'll see it in a second. Um, but have you guys ever, um, maybe you've said this or done this before, but there's that common phrase, don't shoot the messenger. You heard of that before? Don't shoot the messenger. Um, biblically speaking, I think there is an appropriate amount of fear that we should all have. Um, and the messenger, the one who has sent us, ought to be the one that, that we fear uh, over rejection or hostility of of our message. My main point this morning uh, that hopefully you can make sense of is this, is that fear of the Lord is the antithesis of apathy and apprehension. Fear of the Lord, I, I read a lot of dictionaries this week, 
Okay, I like, found all these big words. I was like, I like those words, stretching myself a little bit. Fear of the Lord is the antithesis, someone say that three times fast, of apathy and apprehension. Isaiah 61, or sorry, Isaiah 6, verse 1 through 9, um, the famous passage you guys probably know. Isaiah has this vision of heaven and he comes before the throne of God. And it says this, I saw the Lord. And he was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending to him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet. And with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it is all over. I am doomed, for I am such a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal, and he had taken it from the altar with a pair of tongues. He touched my lips with it. He said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom shall I send a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me. And he said, yes. Go. Someone say go. I don't know if we play up the imagination enough. I mean, there's a lot of scary things in that verse. One of the scariest things for me is the coal that touches the lips. I mean, we just read that. We're like, oh, that's a pretty image of purification. (laughs) If I was to pull, like John does this like fireside challenge at his house. If if we were to pull one of those things out of the fire and bring it to your lips this morning, uh, how many guys could stand there without flinching? right? And we get to the conclusion of all this. Of course, we, we know that he's purified right now. He's, he's able to stand within this, this picture of the glorious throne of God. But he says, here I am. Send me. And uh, I've never seen it this way before, but you know, I wonder if he was just fearful of, of what would happen if he didn't volunteer. You know what I'm saying? You've seen the Hunger Games before, like volunteers tribute, right? Yeah, like, Lord, anything you need. If you're asking, I'm going. Whatever you need, I'll do it. Why? Because he, he had a, a fear of the Lord. And, and this is missing so much today. And, and in fact, it also gets downplayed so much today. We're, we're afraid of the fear of the Lord. We're afraid of of the rejection of the message to call people to a fear of the Lord. And so we downplay the fear of the Lord to like, oh, well, it's just this like reverence for the Lord. It's not that it's not. It absolutely is. But notice how you get to that place of reverence. Notice how you get to the position of on your knees with this coal touching your lip. There's this, I mean, the image that I don't know if you guys have been in an earthquake before. Um, I was in Seattle, nine years old, when that big one happened, and uh, like the get under your desk, that was a real thing, you know, and uh, we all got under the desk, and then the the earth is shaking. I mean, that's a fearful, it's not like, oh, that's just an awe. We were just in awe of the earthquake in that moment. (laughs) We were in fear of being totally out of control, subjected to the power of something greater than us. This is the fear of the Lord. And yes, fear of the Lord will lead you to a place of of awe. Yes, it will lead you to a place of holy reverence. But fear is not defined any other way than fear. Um, I mean, read it all throughout the scriptures. There's there's the, the, the nation of Israel going up the mountain, and the Lord calls them up the mountain, and they go, nope, not us. We'll send Moses. Nose goes. He's send Moses up the mountain. We don't want to go anywhere near that. Fire and lightning and thunder and the mountain is shaking. Moses is like, I guess I'm the one. And he goes up the mountain. Fear of the Lord is the antithesis of apathy and and apprehension. 
I think that the, the rapid spread of the gospel in the, the book of Acts of the Apostles is attributed to the fact that their fear of the Lord was greater than their fear of man. Their fear of the Lord was greater than their fear of man. And I, and I don't think there's enough of us in, in the church today that, that could say that. They say we fear the Lord more than we fear the rejection of or we fear the um, opinion of. I might look funny. I might sound weird. I might be anti-cultural. And we fear the rejection of man. We fear all these excuses and things. But if we really feared the Lord more than we feared man, then, then our these apprehensions of the gospel would seek to exist. We wouldn't worry about this apathy or this comfort or this fear because we would be so motivated by the calling, the commission. When Jesus says, look, all authority in heaven, in the earth and under the earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples Revelation uh, 12, verse 1, um, is interesting. It talks about the, the testimony that they defeated the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. It says this, they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. John Piper in his book, Don't Waste Your Life, he says, one of my aims is to explode the myth of safety and to be delivered from the enchantment of security. The tragic hypocrisy is that the enchantment of security paralyzes us from taking risks for others on the Calvary road of love. We are deluded and we think that it may jeopardize a security that in fact does not even exist. I hope to disenchant you with the mirage of security, to simply go to the Bible and see that it is right to risk for the cause of Christ. And not to is to waste your life. Fear of the wrong thing. I, I know I gave you this big application point this morning. And um, I think sometimes we need to stretch our brain muscles a little bit. And that's what I was doing this week. Um, I, I know it's a big statement to say that fear of the Lord is the antithesis of apathy and apprehension. Um, but I, I'll word it more elementary and say this. That fear of the wrong thing results in endless possibilities and probabilities, distractions and procrastinations, all of which prevent us from doing the right thing. Fear of the wrong thing leads us in so many other directions. And no matter which of those directions you take, fear will lead us to inaction, to procrastination. It will prevent us from doing the thing that is the right thing. But if we fear the right thing, that is the Lord, we will do the right thing, which is to respond to the call of his mission. And uh, I'll say this a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, fortunately and unfortunately for us, most of us, um, we aren't living in a fear of suffering or persecution. Um, most of us, we have much greater things to fear, much greater things to worry, like rejection, or our feelings getting hurt, or the fear of our appearance. These are the great American persecutions that we face. We're like, oh, but what if they don't like me? What if they don't want to be friends with me? What if they call me something derogatory? We're like, oh, I can't stand that. And so I'm just not going to be moved to action out of this fear of the great American persecution. <laughs> All in all, there's that real persecution that, that people face today. There's real suffering, and, and if you look at it, we could stand to experience more suffering today for the cause of Christ. Because it's under suffering and it's under persecution that, that the church rises up and gets a backbone and begins to stand up for the cause, this, this boldness. Again, remember the, the beautiful feet, F-E-A-T, act of boldness boldness, that, that the apostles, they weren't afraid. They didn't love their life more than the cause and the sake of Christ. They weren't fearful of death. Um, an evangelist friend, he once told me, he said, the problem is most of us are carrying around with us 50 reasons why someone wouldn't want to hear the gospel 
rather than five reasons why they would. We see people and we interact with people and we go, oh, they, they wouldn't want to hear it. And we have 50 reasons already pre-made that they haven't told us, but we've made up in our mind that we carry around with us. Oh, they, they wouldn't want to hear this message. Rather than five reasons why someone actually would. That maybe Jesus was actually truthful when he said that the harvest is, is great, but the workers are few. Don't have a harvest problem. We have a, a worker problem. We have people carry around these these fears and these apathies and these comforts that that kill us into to procrastination and inaction, and this fear of man that keeps us from doing the right thing. But if we would learn to fear the Lord, Luke twelve says this: Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. And um, you know, we just kind of read this verse, but the reason Jesus read this verse is because of the other one we just read that said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Like, we're so far removed from this in the American church. And I'm not even saying, like, put in those situations like I'm the first one to stand up. You know what I'm saying? Because I've been born in a culture of comfort. I've been born in a place of, of American freedom. But... The reason Jesus said these words is because he was literally sending them out as sheep among wolves. All of the the apostles were were martyred and killed for their faith. And it's their sacrifice, it's their, their proclamation and their fear of God over the fear of man that led to the great spread of the gospel so that you and I today can call on the name of Jesus Christ. It's under the, the fear and the persecution and the suffering that the, the church grew in mass number. And we, we see this still going on today in China and other parts of the world. Um, uh, the Christianity is this declining religion here in the States. And you'd think that hope is lost when you look at, at America. But when you look at the world at large, the gospel of Jesus Christ is spreading on a scale that it's never spread before. It's moving in countries that are hostile to the message of Jesus Christ. And and so Jesus says this. He says, look, dear friends, don't be afraid. Why? Because there's people who want to kill your body. And they will. And and we just kind of read it and we're like, well, we don't need to worry about that. Uh, But Jesus said this because it was an actual threat. Don't fear those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more to you after that. But I will tell you whom to fear. Fear God. Someone say that. Fear God who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he is the one to fear. Jesus, Jesus said those words. (laughs) Jesus said those words. And, And here's the deal. Look, you and I, we don't need to defend Jesus or the words of Jesus. I think we're so quick to, to make it easier to stomach. Jesus was not um, fearful of rejection. He was actually quite comfortable with it. Jesus was, was quite comfortable. Look at his life and ministry. He was comfortable with rejection, and he often was rejected. Crowds of people. And, um, you know, he says, look, I'm the, the bread of life, and unless you eat this cup, and unless you drink my blood, and, and the crowds walked away. Jesus didn't go, no, I take it back. I was just, I was just you know, this is what I really meant. Jesus wasn't afraid of the, the rejection of man, but he is in, in his, his confident power and authority calling all people to himself, to those that would take up the cause of Christ and take up the, the call to follow. And we see some people left and walked away, and there's other people that left their nets and took up the call to follow Jesus. John 15, verse 18 through 19 says, If the world hates you, Remember that it first hated me. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it, but you are no longer a part of this world, for I chose you to come out of the world, and so it hates you. You and I need to learn to fear the right thing, because fear of the Lord, it is the antithesis of apathy and apprehension. Hebrews 10, 32 through 36 it says, think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. 
You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail and all that they owned was taken from them and you accepted it with joy for you knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward that it brings to you for patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do what? God's will. And then you will receive all that he has promised. Now I read that verse and again, I, I know there's, there's places today in the world where, where all of these things are true. But I think here in the comforts of home, all we really have is the fear of this public ridicule. And we're like, mm, I can't do that, Lord. It's too much to ask. It's too much of a burden to bear. If I asked you this, I mean, would you rather have public ridicule or have all your stuff taken away to be suffered and beaten, to be placed into jail, right? Like public ridicule is not all that bad in comparison. I think we can get over it. I think you and I could, could probably find a way to stand against it. What is it that keeps you from from the cause of Christ, the Great Commission. If we could, I I love the way Piper said it, if if we could just shake off the the myth of security. That's that's what comfort is. I mean, we have 401ks and we plan for retirement and we have this this future prosperity and, and we're working hard to just like be able to predict the future. But he says, look, if I could just shatter that myth for you because security doesn't last. James says, look, who are you here to say, this is what I'm going to go tomorrow and do, and I'm going to go make a profit. He says, your life, it's like a mist. Here today, and then it's gone. Um, Lindsay, this is just public record so that I'm forced to do it later. Lindsay told me, she said, Taylor, we need to get a will, and we need life insurance um, because you could die. And um, she said she was just talking to some moms the other day, someone, um, type 1 diabetic. I'm a type 1 diabetic, if you didn't know that. Guy just died in his sleep at random. He's young, in his 40s, um, just died, and they didn't have life insurance, all those things. She's like, Taylor, you need to do this. <laughs> like, we think we're, we're immortal. We think we can just live forever. We, we have plans, and, and we're like, well, I'm going to make it to that, that golden age number. But none of us really know if life is guaranteed tomorrow, security is, is a myth. And if we could shake off that myth and, and become urgent about the things that, that we're called and commissioned to do now so that we don't come to the end of our life and waste it, so we don't go, man, I, I wish, had I had known that was the finish line, I would have done all this in my 20s or in my 30s or in my 40s. Had I known that I had 10 more years from 70, I would have plugged harder. I would have pushed further. I would have invested into that relationship. If if I could just shake off the apathy and the comfort and the fear and begin to fear the right thing. It's a a beautiful feat. Let me come to a, a couple notes here in close. I guess I did come to the end of my message. It's surprising for me because usually I go like 10 minutes later. So maybe that's all I got to say today. I hope it was a good one. Um, if, we, if we could come to it, this, this beautiful feat, let's read that again. It's a noteworthy or extraordinary act or achievement usually displaying boldness. If we were to be people of of beautiful feet for the sake of of God's mission and for the sake of the Great Commission. My friend Arnie, um, he says this all the time, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it's it's helpful. He says, look, uh, I don't want to come to the end of my life and, and come to face Jesus. And Jesus looks at me and says, Arnie, you settled for this but I created you for this. So I want to hear the words, well done. You took up my call and my purpose for your life and you did it with urgency and you did it with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Too many of us settle for mediocrity 
for just a Christian faith that's content to show up to church on Sundays, content to maybe have a few conversations with our kids and pass it along, and, and it just kind of stays there, and, and we're content with it. There's very few of us taking on this, this feat, and the thing that keeps us from it is Jesus' words, hey, I'm sending you out as little sheep among wolves. Yeah, there's, there's risks, but the, the risks are, are worth it. And you'll never take those risks unless you learn to fear the right thing. And it's why he gives us the empowerment, as we'll talk about in the, in the next couple of weeks here, the great empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You look at Peter before the, the death of Christ, and he denies Jesus three times. The disciples are running and they're hiding to be associated with with the message of Christ because they could be put to death for it. And we see the, the empowerment. I, don't, I wish I could quote him from memory. I should learn more about the martyrs, but I think it's Peter hung upside down on a cross. Stephen, who was stoned, they run into the face of danger for the sake of, of the mission because their fear of God was greater than their fear of man. Let's read. Let's just conclude with this verse here. Revelations 12, verse 11. For they defeated him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. For they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. And um, I know I'm making up stuff to like push you guys further. I should probably just conclude. But I'll, <laughs> I'll say the last thing and then um, you'll still get out of here earlier than usual. So... Last week, if you remember, we talked about um, the, the, the mission of God. It begins with God and that um, the whole message of Christ, is you don't really find yourself until you lose yourself. Yet culture would preach this message like you need to first learn to love yourself because if you have self-love and you can love yourself, then you can begin to, to love others. And the gospel is like completely opposite. I don't have the ability to love myself or to find love within myself. All of that is external. It comes from, from God, the perfect image of love in the Trinity. And I receive that love. I, I put to death myself the love of self for the love of God in turn and the love of others. Um, and, and it just hit me when I read that verse. They, they did not love their lives so much they were afraid to die. Why? Because they already died. They already put to death the, the life of self, the comforts of self, the fear of what might happen to this body because their love was of something greater. You and I learned to fear the right thing this morning. And that's my prayer for you. It's my, my prayer for me. And I don't know if all of us will, will take it up, to be honest. Um, you know, I'd like to say, optimistically, we all would. There's 63%, we'll talk about this later in the groups this week, 63% of people in America today confess and attribute themselves to a belief in faith and Christianity. But only 4% of that 63% can actually be defined as disciples and followers of Jesus. So the reality is, though optimistically, I'd say, man, I hope all of us would just say, as Isaiah said, sign me up, Lord, take that coal, touch my lips. Most of us will, will cave out to the fear and the worries of life and, and everything else that gets in the way of actually responding to the call. But for those of us that, through the great empowerment of the Spirit of God, with boldness would say, man, we want to be people of beautiful feet, messengers of the gospel and of the good news. Man, my hope is that more of us would, would take that charge today and say, yep, that's me. Send me out among the wolves. I'm ready. I'm ready to run with the best of them. So let me pray for you. Just pray a prayer of, of boldness and response. And, and I don't ever want to, I'm never like a pastor to convince you. None of my messages are persuasive. Otherwise, I'd preach much differently. I'd get my grammar under control a lot better if I was trying to articulate things well enough to persuade you. Um, just want self-evaluation this morning. It, are you someone of, of beautiful feet? And I, there is no greater compliment 
in this lifetime, I think, than, than that of Lindsay's friends to Lindsay. And, uh, man, I want people to look at me <laughs> and tell me the same thing. Taylor, you have beautiful feet. Steve, you have beautiful feet. Sam, you have beautiful feet. He washed them. He wasn't afraid of feet. That's right. So where are you today? Will you be a messenger of the good news? Will you be a lamb among wolves? Will, will you be a worker sent out to do the work of harvest? Because the, the harvest is ready and it's waiting for you. And he's just asking who will be sent. And today we have the opportunity to respond and say, Jesus, that's me. Send me. So Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for the fullness of your gospel. So many times we, we kind of buffet style and pick out the parts that we like, but it's the, the, the fullness of it, the, the fact that, Lord, you empower us with everything we need that makes it so rich, so promising, so fulfilling. Lord, that you are sending us out into this world and sure, there's going to be rejection and sure, there's going to be hatred, but Lord, you said, I've already taken all of those things on myself. The world first hated me. I, I first suffered in your place and I'm giving you the great empowerment of my spirit you conclude the words of the Great Commission with, be sure of this, that I will be with you always to the end of the age. Lord, would we learn to properly fear the right thing this morning so that we would be motivated by your love to do the right thing, to risk everything for the cause and the sake of Christ Jesus, for the mission of the Great Commission, Jesus. Lord, that's me. Today, I, I want to be someone of, of beautiful feet. And the prayer this morning is that, Lord, many of us in this room would take up that call today. We'd say, that's me. I want to be that person, that messenger of beautiful feet today. So, Lord, call us, commission us, send us. Let us respond to the call in which you've placed on everyone here this morning, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.